Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. Uh, we have to start uh, right away because uh, normally if we don't start on time, this will finish around 1 or 2 o'clock actually. Even though we only have two speakers. So anyway, can I bid a very warm welcome to everyone here this morning. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to particularly welcome my former chairman and this gentleman was a former minister and uh, PNB chairman, all the highest posts in the country, this gentleman has held. And I'm so honored that he has uh, decided to come, uh, who is currently the chairman of uh, University Kebangsaan Malaysia too. So Tan Sri, welcome to this talk. We are very honored for your presence. Uh, I was joking outside with him that my former deputy in the University of Malaya is now under him, you know. And I'm glad to know that uh, despite all the hardships I think that Vice Chancellor may be facing, but uh, he has a very good mentor uh, to work with. So anyway, I think uh, UKM is in good hands then. <clears throat> now, uh, we continue in our Jeffrey Cha uh, Institute seminar series, uh, and this is the first or four seminars for 2019. Uh, and I'm very delighted, besides myself, uh, that I'm uh, welcoming Datuk Azra'i, Datuk Dr. Azra'i, who is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Genova C University College. Uh, a little introduction about him. Uh, he was formerly the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs when I was the Vice Chancellor in UM. So I've seen his performance and he has done very well as a Deputy Vice Chancellor, particularly in surviving the board meetings in UM. <laughs> uh, in my whole career, I've been 17 years managing uh, two institutions. I thought the, uh, the post of the Vice Chancellor of UM was the toughest because sometimes you don't know whether to behave an academic or behave as a thug, you know? but uh, it's a mixture of these uh, functions sometimes. <clears throat> so Dr. Azra'i was my deputy uh, as uh, deputy vice chancellor for uh, student affairs. Uh, he got his early bachelor degree in the University of Malay itself in zoology, is that right? Dato? Ecology. Later on, he got his PhD from University of Stirling. Abrin, Abrin. See how I can forget everything. And then he was in the University of Malaya for quite a long time and uh, he retired about two years ago, I think. And he is now doing a very challenging job in online university, uh, <clears throat> which I think if done properly, uh, this would be a, a good university to bet on. Uh, because online means you can actually educate the masses. So Dato will come and talk about it, and in particular how he will uh, uh, support the Industry 4.0 initiative in this country, which is so important. Uh, so that will be Dato Azra'i talking uh, on Industry 4.0. The second half of the morning, I will be doing the talk uh, where I will be concentrated. I will be talking about uh, financial uh, sustainability of universities. Uh, <clears throat> even though generally the impression now, at the moment, our PTPT and loan is in deep stress, financial stress, and so on, but I think there's certain. Uh, development that is ongoing where it gives a really good hope. And for that, I think it's good to highlight that uh, private universities have to come up with a new model to fit into these challenges. Because if people are going into the private higher education business for the sole purpose of making profit, I think this is a disaster. It won't last. There's no certainty about it. And along the way, you need to be sold and a new owner comes in and so on. So this, the days of going into education to make money is not there anymore. <clears throat> so you have to come up with a new model. So I'll be roughly concentrating on that. What are the possible new models uh, to survive in this era? Uh, <clears throat> 
But the issue about student loan funding and so on is not a new issue. It is happening all over the world. In fact, I would say in the US, they don't even know how to solve the problem because the total student debt is 1.5 trillion as of last year. It may have reached 1.7 trillion today. And the the U.S. government is really talking about it is possible that 20 to 30 percent of those in debt uh, with the student loan and so on may default in their payment and so on, and it will have a very big uh, impact on the economy. And in the U.K., it is also the same story. I will show some slides how some university in U.K. is already expected to be declared bankrupt, insolvent and so on. And the same story goes to Australia. So what is happening in Malaysia is not something new. It is already happening somewhere else. The issue is how do we survive? What new models can we propose into this? But before we go into that, uh, let us hear from Dr. Ansarani how his new institution will help uh, support the uh, Industry 4.0 agenda. Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Tan Sri Gauss. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good uh, morning. First of all, uh, my thanks to Tansi Kaos for inviting me to give this speech and also to Jeffrey Chia Institute for allowing me to be here and to the audience, Tansi, thank you for coming. Well, the topic that I'm going to discuss today, we discussed a bit with Tansi, probably this is more suitable for this platform. Uh, pairing with him on the changes, uh, the financial changes, we are looking at the more at the pedagogical change, uh, change the challenges. I show this slide just to show to you that the world is not static. The biological world that we live in is very dynamic. With, of course, in terms of biological species, the human beings are at the apex. But before us, there are many predecessors and so on. So this is, our mind should be looking at this angle, that the world is very dynamic. Biologically, as well as in other spheres of life. I'm showing just a representative of the technological advancements. In this case, is the telephones, uh, starting from its uh, early days, now we have around this area, oh, sorry, we have, we have smartphones, but in future, probably they are more advanced than we thought we can have. Okay, so this is again dynamicity in reality, in life, moving on. So in this regards, if we look at the industry, the authors has divided, so far, there are four industrial revolutions. Way back, Industry 1.0 is when the power engine, steam engine, was uh, invented by James Watt. That changed the landscape of the industry. Then this 2.0 with electrical power, Tesla, in the 1880s. Another game changer. Uh, uh, that allows the uh, mass productions, assembly line and so on. Again, it's changing the world landscape. Of course, when it changes the world landscape, it also changes the uh, social aspect, the economical aspect, even the political aspect. But the base is the technological, technological changes. Of course, we have the 3.0 when I was still a school student, start with the computer age, is the electronics, and now we are talking about Industry 4.0, is the, where the this physical realms and the biological is merging. Yeah? The, the machine is also learning as about human beings. What the, are the impacts of these changes in education? This is not a new thing now. Most of us among the audience is fully aware of this, but we are looking at a very uh, close at the implementation angle of how universities should be adapting itself, particularly in the context of uh, Malaysia. 
here are the five characteristics of 4.0. It is interconnection because of the digitalizations of everything. We are easily connected from one end to another end of the world. Data, what we call the big data, explosion of data, very massive, voluminous. It's integrations of all these things. It's also, the industry point four is also about innovations. And of course, uh, finally, it is still at this stage in the transition stage. And these are the nine technical backbone of Industry 4.0. Of course, AI is there, industrial internet, cloud computing, big data, robotics, three or four D printings, automations, network security, and uh, virtual reality. These are just the backbone. Of course, there are many peripheral uh, discipline as well. So it is a convergence, as I said before, between uh, machine and man. If we can graph the technological advancement, it's just like a hockey stick. We have a short uh, initial phase, we have an exponential increase, just like the uh, population. Our population is also more or less like hockey sticks. Yeah. From a very slow start, then it increases drastically towards the end in very shorter periods. I would like to take this example. I think everyone of you is quite familiar with Jeopardy, where in 2011 they test this. They, they call it the IBM Watson. The one in the center, oh sorry, the one in the center is non-human. Competing between two champions here, Brad and Ken, in this episode. Whereby, of course, in the first round, the computer is losing. But then on, when he learns, he's picking up. And at the end, uh, the computer won over the two human champions. And this is the first show of the ability of machine to overdo human being. Just as an example here, using the algorithms embedded in the system, okay? Because it, this computer and this human being have got a few seconds to think. So the first one second, millisecond might be very important to detect what's the keywords. So then it will do the searching in all whatever available database, millions of million database. And in this case, the computer is very, very confident, 98% confidence of the answer. Albinism is the answer. And uh, of course, the system associate albino, 10%, and foriferia, 7%. It takes the highest, of course. And has shown that in many of the rounds, the computer is winning over Brad and Ken. So back to IBM Watson, they call it Mr. Watson. Okay. So this is the brief history of it, but since 2011, it has been applied in many industries. Medical, legal, and so many, many fields. In the short periods of 2011, the algorithm is there, it's just to expand the algorithm. Because of that, we have digital medicines. Here, the doctor is assisted by uh, Watson Medical, Medical Watson, eh? Medical Watson, to help him. Uh, just outside, just now, the Tan Sri White say, probably the doctor will not be replaced at the moment, but the computing will actually greatly help the doctor in interpreting, in looking at databases. Yeah? It helps a lot. Likewise, in digital law, current, currently, the, the law firm has to employ a lot of lawyers to just to prepare and dig all the data from their files for argument. But with computer helping them, this becomes seconds. 
so aiding but of course there will be loss of job as well yeah? the need of the legal uh, officers and so on lawyers young lawyers will not be there this is more or less uh, roughly the phases of computing what is interest us now we are talking about cognitive computing era meaning to say the computer is becoming a thinking computer learning computer able to have emotion and so on later on as we see so these are the changes real th real life changes that we saw so it's not impossible one day the compute the robots or the computer is manipulating the computer to do things rather than human being manipulating the computer okay this is dangerous they might program to kill tansi gauss you know? <laughs> you know? we have that very specific uh, weapon already uh, going exactly through the you know, by using drone and so on to target individual person uh, not mass uh, individual person so it's already in existence actually so i'm just talking about the environment first okay because i have one hour so these are the robotics world now that we have in hand you can just buy it now in from the united states not very expensive three thousand four thousand you have uh, for example a lawnmower robotic lawnmower you just leave it there it will charge itself you, if the grass is longer they will go out all automated all programmed by itself you can just leave it there and all of this are all automated okay this is your vacuum cleaner you can go at every angle no need to push it anymore it's just program it and so on this robot can detect absenteeism in in your office because it will relay the information so this robot is looking at the office there so oh, this guy is there okay he's at home the boss is at home so okay, you can really monitor so the robot can go from one room to one room will go to the to the pantry at 12 uh, nine o'clock in the morning go to the pantry is the pantry is occupied or not and so on so you can really program this hmm? okay. we have chatbot talking robot in china you can uh, use chatbot to book your flight and so on well according to this study uh, in 2016 80 percent of business intend to use one of these robotic de de devices you go beyond that it's robotic wife now it's available you can book from se several companies the one in japan so when you say robotic wife meaning this robot is emotionally is very can express emotion can say good morning sir how are you can show expression so it's beyond uh, static thing but it's very biological in nature now and according to this uh, sex robot uh, creator we are thinking of giving birth of this robot but of course not a biological birth it's just another robot but it doesn't stop them to invest to do research to have a biological birth later on let what we do in cloning and so on hmm? another field of a development is the blockchain technology uh, with blockchain is peer to peer it's very transparent it's very safe and with, with blockchain the cryptocurrency is possible without blockchain the uh, cryptocurrency the first one i think is bitcoin in 2009 it's not possible but beyond cryptocurrency blockchain can be applied to various fields of life for example the uae is blockchaining the whole government apparatus and i think one of the best use would be for politician is to blockchain the voting processes thereby you cannot really you know manipulate it's very transparent it's forensics you can trace back yeah, you can trace back 
Uh, because it's, it goes in block uh, and it's verified by other nodes, nodes mean other servers, other computers, the whole world, and nobody can cheat. If, you, if the hacker can hack one computer, there's another 99% of computer saying the original uh, transaction. So blockchain is the future uh, when we talk about security and so on. So this is uh, the pathway of blockchain to technical. Uh, back home, uh, we have uh, this company, uh, Dina Dirham, that's using blockchain. Uh, they start with the Dina Dirham coins, where at that time, they uh, put against the gold value, the asset. They call it the Dina asset. I think it's very uh, innovative because uh, gold was used as currency before and was disused because you cannot actually uh, break it down. Let's say one, one dinar coin here is 4.25 grams, the old dinar weight, 4.25 grams. Okay, of course, when you want to buy smaller things, you cannot break down the gold into smaller denominations. But if you digitalize the gold value, you can go to 0 0.00 to 7 decimal point. Meaning to say, if the gold is coupled with the digital digitalization of it, you can be very practical. You can use gold. But of course, you don't bring your gold. You keep your gold somewhere else. But what you have is your electronic wallet that will monitor this. What's the balance in your uh, gold stock? So there's a very innovative use of gold. You back it, but it's short, short lived uh, because it has to go with the mainstream uh, cryptocurrency. Now it's migrating from DNC to DDK, which is going to be launched sometime next week or after one year of uh, R&D and developing it. It's developed by Ukrainian scientists. This is Dato Arai. I met him several times uh, to trying to get him to establish the school of blockchain in my university. But because he was with this uh, development, he said, I'll come later. But just to say that we have in our own home, a genius, an entrepreneur looking at this. So Dina, they call it DDK, Dina coin will be on par with other cryptocurrencies. Of course, there are many cryptocurrencies now, over 3,000, I think. Yeah. But this will be ours, and I think our own government, Pakatan Harapan, has really issued its own cryptocurrency. So all this cryptocurrency is basing on blockchain. Without blockchain, there will be no cryptocurrency. So this is the currency of the future. In the finance technology, we have the boss here, Tan Sri Wahid. Yeah. They have used, the fintech is moving far ahead in, with respect to other fields. Yeah, they have used everything available, for example, digital mobile, mobile experience, biometrics and identity security, blockchain, open API banks, big data, and so on. It's been all been used. And it depends on the country. Some countries are moving very fast. They have every weekly meeting to look at fintech forums and so on. Some countries are quite slow. For example, Malaysia, uh, quite slow in terms of cryptocurrency. Uh, I think the several white papers have been sent to Bank Nagara in the sandbox. Mm. Our ATM, I think the ATM, for example, automatic teller machine was first produced in UK in 1970s, but it come to Malaysia 20 years later, in the 1990s. So we are quite slow in adapting to it. I think Singapore is very fast in terms of fintechs. Law have to be amended and so on, quickly looking at uh, the scenario, the laws have to change as well. So we really have to move. The hush rate today is people need banking, they don't necessarily need banks. You see, that's why we can see bank closing down, merging, 
because all is done automated, you know, online banking and so on. So this forced the banks to think differently. Okay, big data, Internet of Things. When you combine blockchain and Internet of Things, you can also apply it in real life, as this in this case. I need to go faster. You have uh, Uber, which is self-driverless. Now Uber is still in Malaysia is with drivers, but in countries, the Uber is already driverless. Hmm? Ways very make our life very easy, but also make our tends to be forgetful now. Luckily, you have ways you now you cannot go back home <laughs> to that extent. This is just uh, quite recent a battery that can last for 400 years by MIT student just by putting a coating of gel in the nano wires. Okay. So it's still not uh, commercialized, but once commercialized, we can forget about charging every now and then, every five hours, every six hours. And this is uh, by accident eh, in this experiment. Well, your, your smartphone is now your TV. Uh, this is good for learning. Yeah? The social medias, a lot of these social medias, if you look at these number statistics, uh, in terms of the using of internet, it's almost 53% of the world population at 7.5 billion now. Uh, social media users, staggering 42%, and mobile unit users, 68%, and so on. This is a statistic for the uh, social media. Of course, Facebook is the highest, with 2.7 billion users at the moment of this research. In, in the agri agricultural landscapes, we have precision farming, precision agriculture, meaning you can really program when to apply the nutrients in the right quantity, right moment. You can detect when the cow is on estrus, when to milk it, and it's all programmable from remote devices. The farmer can stay in, in, in Malaysia, his farm is in US, and still looking at the farm. And Israel is very far advanced in this precision farming. And this is not an imagination, it's a reality. And we need this because as the human population increases, we need to feed them. Okay, we need to feed ourselves. So if you look at this graph, the rate of learning is quite gradual. Whereas the rate of change of knowledge of technology is exponential. There's a large gap here. This is where we are here today to discuss on this and look and how especially in the field of education. So humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years when we start our first industrial revolutions. So how are the universities preparing for students in this scenario? So the key elements to look at this question is what type of student are we going to teach? The way, sorry, the way we teach, the content we teach, and the concept and structure of education that we give. So these are the four elements that I will discuss today. Who are the students? If you look at this, we are looking at Generation Z, which is born between 1995 and 2015, at this, when this was constructed. Just a matter of interest, our Prime Minister this batch, the greatest generation. Uh, he was born, I think, somewhere here, with the age of uh, 94. So we still have few in this generation. Uh, myself is baby boomers. I think Tansky is a baby boomers. 
Many of us are baby, baby boomers. Yeah? Well, we, oh, here we have still got four in the lost generation. As of a few days back, 8th of April, Kene Tanaka, which born on 2nd January, still is living at the age of 116 and how many days? Eh? 96 days. So now we 100 days. Lah. 100 days. This was 8th April, 11 April, three more days. Add to that. And three more in Italy. These are verified. Of course, there might be unverified older people. But what interests us here is this group. This is our student, Generation Z, 34%. Hmm? Our, our, our generation, 14%. And becoming very fast now. Many mortality. One day you hear your friends just you know, pass away. Another friend pass away. So in one year, many of the baby boomers is passing away. Huh? So this is the pathway, technological pathway of Generation Z. When they were born, these gadgets are within their life, with their mothers, their families. And this is where the formative years, in their formative years, they are exposed to this gadget as compared to us in the baby boomers. I think we still play gassing, um, what, all those, uh, what, seremban, eh? Seremban, these traditional uh, games in the Malay villages, and the Chinese might be different, but I play the Indian games, you know, the gudu, gudu, gudu. Uh, uh, every morning in the field, gudu, 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 gudu. Very physical uh, game. Uh, or we take the, the seeds of the rubber tree, the seed, uh, we crash, and the one who stays, doesn't break, is the champion. Uh, this is the type of game that we have. And in fact, if we reflect back to all this, I don't believe I'm staying in this age. I never thought of a hand phone in my pocket. Never. Never thought of that when I was a school student. Of, get, of having a phone in the pocket. Of having a phone while toileting. Yeah, talking while in the toilet bowl. Never thought of that. Of course, this is reality we have to face. So we focus on Generation Z. The survey shows that this group of generations, huh, these are the percentages they're involved in. YouTube, 31%, Instagram, and so on. It's all digital. So they have what they call it, the digitalized DNA inside their body, inside their brain. And they also call being the uh, digital digital natives. Okay. So from the very start until old age, they are with these digital devices. And these are the type of student you're going to, to, to teach. And you can see the generation gap between the teachers and the student. If we teachers it's not going to look at this gap, then the student, our generation will be victimized because we are holding the post of the teachers. They cannot become teachers because they're still young. So meaning to say, we as educators, we have to really be aware of this, look and to adapt ourselves to teach this generation. Because they cannot stay in class anymore. Okay. Uh, in this slide, it's showing that there's a lot. Is this generation Z? They are exposed to all these uh, education apps yeah. available, teaching themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. This research shows the characteristic between millennials and generation Z. On this side is the uh, 
characters of the millennials. Millennials are my, my, my children. And of course, this one, they are self-aware, persistent, realist. They are very realist, innovative, and self-reliant, as opposed to these characters. In terms of skill needed, this, the research shows that for this group, they need cognitive flexibility and emotional intelligence. How much time I have? Another one hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> How is the universities preparing for them? Now, we have seen the scenario of the environment. Then we have seen the scenario of our potential students. Now, our question is, uh, how are we going to prepare against this background? Now we look how the way we teach. These terms, heterogy, pedagogy, cybergogy, is against pedagogy and heterogy. Uh, these are the type of things that we are looking at closely to encourage learners to be become more self-directed, self-determined. Pedagogy peer, among the peers, we have to encourage this co-learning. And of course, uh, on be online, cyber, because the information is online. So these are the gogis that we are looking at. Yeah? In addition to pedagogy and other gogis. If we look at the technological pedagogy, the delivery, this is our time when I went to the primary school. We have only the green board or the black board, not even this. We enter the university in the 1980s, we have this, not even this. Then we have this transparency. I think most of us, baby boomers, will remember this. Uh, very hot, very heaty, the lecturer there putting, have to prepare the transparency, you know, and so on. Gone, gone, absolute. The young generation doesn't understand what it means by transparency anymore. Huh? Of course, then we have the sorry, we have the PowerPoint, which is absolute now, almost absolute. We cannot just show the students a very static PowerPoint. That's why I'm showing now. Okay, so this is going to be absolute. Generation Z will not accept it. They will sleep. Empty classroom, empty lecture room. If we continue to give them the way we, 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 we learned before. On the online, well, online education is not new. I mean, distant learning is not new. We start from postal, then we, the newspaper, learning over the radio, and later on television. This, of course, is absolute long, long time ago. Yeah? With the internet, things change. So we are talking about blended learning now. The interface of normal conventional learning and also the uh, online learning. Uh, many types of blended learning. So this is ready in practice of blended learning, but not so much in Malaysian's uh, landscape, education landscape. Because uh, blended learning requires uh, more capital input because less student is put into the classroom. Uh, I have the opportunity to went to one of the company that uh, doing this blended learning. Uh, they have a classroom, this size occupied by 10 to 15 students with all the TVs, cameras, and then around. A combination of human being and the machine. And these are the type of learning that Generation Z will want. So this is uh, online learning, changing the classroom setting up, everyone with a computer and so on, no more, uh, no more this type of uh, classroom. Hmm? This is the traditional classroom uh, setup. Okay, this is another slide for that okay. and this is virtual reality in education uh, I don't know in Malaysia whether we have this where the student will wear the gadget and look at virtual reality 
Uh, this is of course in China and uh, this in China and then this in the European countries. And uh, apart from virtual reality is the augmented reality, real plus virtual, both. This is very good for teaching, yeah, augmented reality, especially for certain fields like uh, architecture, even medicine and so on. Okay, this augmented reality. Uh, webinar, it's an online seminar for students and so on. YouTube can be really utilized instead of the PPT. Wearable assisted teaching, watches and so on. Now there are about 3.5 million apps of which 15% are educational, especially for the uh, younger children. So the future of the world is in my classroom, according to Welton Fitzwater. If we teach today's students as we taught yesterday, we rob them of their tomorrow, according to the way. So this is true. Hmm? We have to think ahead of the student. So if a child can learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. This is the philosophy you are looking at. Okay, now we go to the third elements, the subject, the content of what we should teach to the student. We should now, although uh, old car, but we can change the content, the engine. Okay, so this is allowed by our MQA, the Malaysian Quality Assurance, that we can change any 30%. So after three years, it's 100%. Yeah? So it's quite flexible uh, from the MQA that allowed us to change the content without referring to them to approval, 30%. Uh, so this is good, okay? New syllabus, apart from content, new syllabus, total new syllabus, which is uh, in terms of RR 4.0 should be career focus what the industry really needs. New degree programs, like blockchain, degree in blockchain, is, and so on. We have examples here, digital manufacturing, design technology, machine learning. Machine learning is a new subject. Industrial IoT, cyber security, intelligent learning, deep learning, blockchain, and so on. Many, many more. These are just examples of new degree that Malaysian University will, should look at. And I think they are moving in this direction for many of the universities. In terms of students, what they should have, there are four elements that is uh, suggested. Uh, collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. Here, with regards to creativity, my own university, uh, we are advocating design thinking school under the Hesso Planet Institute model. Of course, there are many DT, but the DT we are adopting is uh, from HPI Germany. So we make it compulsory for all students that graduated from GUC should undergo at least three to four credits of design thinking, either at the diploma level or bachelor, master's, or PhD. All is a compulsory, apart from the uh, LPU, uh, LPU, is it? MPU, Mata Pelajaran Umum Wajib by MQ. MQ also got make certain requirement compulsory for student. So over and above what the MQA make it compulsory, the university made this compulsory, the DT component. And we are going to look at this very seriously. A uh, few weeks back, I met the originator of the DZ, DT thinking, uh, Professor Ulish from Germany. He said, 
Is it possible that we do a bachelor in DT? He said, no. You are too ambitious. DT is not for a bachelor or for a master's. DT is a tool of thinking. So it should be as a tool, remain as a tool, not as a degree as such. Multi collaborative postgraduate. Remember, one of the, uh, the attributes that we have is collaboration. So now we should think of a very big uh, collaborative uh, hypothesis or question involving many supervisors. And we should graduate from this one project many PhDs, several PhDs, several masters, rather than one PhD for one uh, research or one topic. And this can be within that university or inter-university or internationally. By this, we can have a sharing of common knowledge, common uh, information, and so on. And this is made possible because it's online. And our own government through MyREN, our higher department, our uh, ministry, I'm confused with the, the name of the ministry now, the Kementerian Pelajaran or Pendidikan? Pendidikan, Kementerian Pendidikan now. Uh, before, they have the MyREN, My Research and so on. I think they've increased to 100 kilobytes per second from the 10 kilobytes per second. So with this in place, this uh, concept of collaborative uh, is possible, very, very possible. And this should be the way uh, to save costs, to save time, and to save other resources. Okay? Of course, the topic has to be very, uh, uh, have to be discussed. It's a big topic. Yeah. From there, we can produce many subtopics, sub research. They have, in fact, this design factory global network started by Altov in Sweden, in Finland, sorry. Now, currently, they have in several countries yeah, where there are network between them to do research. So it's really in existence, it's for us to adopt this. Another thing that we should think of is putting the knowledge of computing or information technology across all students. They mean all students must understand this. More Muslims must go through this course, at least three or four credits, or even more than that. So that they become not an illiterate, an IT illiterate, but an IT savvy. And this should be made compulsory uh, by MQA or by the university itself. I think it's very important to equip the student, even in the religious uh, discipline, uh, the language discipline, they need to know this. Because all their devices in their real life applications will bear this knowledge. If you use this analogy, yeah, give a fish, you feed a day, he will finish after you give in. So in the modern sense, show him how to use Google, he can teach himself how to fish all the information. Even our old grandmother now can use Google. Where's the best restaurant to go? <laughs> now finally, the final elements, the concept, the structure of education that we give, New concepts, a nano degree. Nano degree is a new concept. Nano means small. It's not, not about nanotechnology. Eh? Don't mistaken for that. It's nano degree. So this degree uh, first started by Udacity in 2014. Okay. Udacity don't have the license to, to give the award, the degree. Of course, it partnered with Georgia Institute, and of course, it might partner with uh, industry. So three, three components, three partners. So it's an online, six to 12 months, focused on skill, cheap on job, industry value credential. They mean the syllabus is done by the industry, the mentoring by the industry. Okay, the academics is involved, partly, not fully. And in their model, they take the top industries, the top companies. 
And this student will get this short, short nano degree. And this should be because after three years or four years, most of our knowledge will be absolute. So if you have a four year degree, by the time I graduated, my knowledge is already absolute. So to overcome this, we should apply nano degree. These examples of university program on nano degree, uh, deep learning, flying cars, and so on. These are the industry partners. As you can see here, these are the big giants. Yeah? Salesforce, Google, that partner with Audacity to conduct nano degree. So not uh, small, small companies. Facts about nano degree, people looking to improve their skill. Long life, uh, lifelong uh, education and so on. Built with and valued by leading companies, benefit of MOC uh, with support of real people, industry expert, project-based approach and skill-based portfolio. So most of the uh, pedagogy is learning by doing. In nano degrees, learning by doing. You go to the industry in a particular field, hands-on, apart from the theoretical uh, knowledge given by the academics, the practical part by the industry. So this uh, example of the award. So very focused machine learning. So in terms of IT job demands, which can be helped by nano degree, for example here, in 2007, IBM predicted that by 2020, 28%, it may over 2.7 million job listing. But they revised it in 2018, the requirement, the demand is 45%, meaning a staggering much more among the data scientists, chatbot developers, and so on, worldwide, of course. So if you go on a traditional four-year degree, it's very difficult to come with this. So the relevance of nano degree, if you can see here, the rate of change, rate of learning, there's a gap, knowledge gap. So by doing nano degree, we can close the gap. Because any workers can come and you know, upskill or reskill their knowledge and the skill by doing a nano degree. If a university offers a nano degree, I'm a, work, I'm a working adult here, I can just take three months of nano degree eh, to improve, to reskill my knowledge. The challenges is whether our government recognizes this as yet or public confidence in nano degree. But once started, I think people will accept. And we have to face reality that after three years or four years, knowledge is absolute. So nano degree is an answer to this. And I believe the government will be very proactive as a show later, we will accept this. We GUC will start first and probably follow them. Yeah? And nano degree not necessary in the science, science uh, engineering or science field, it can be on the business. I really talking to my dean, Professor uh, Rasat, uh, Roy, Roy, to look at nano degree implementation for business school. Parallel to a nano degree at the degree level, in the, the world has now the micro masters. Micro masters is bridging program from bachelor to masters for those who already got a bachelor, but doesn't have the time to do the full masters of even uh, two years, thank you, Tansi. Okay, so it's a bridging program. When I say micro, meaning it's a short master's, one semester. Okay, one semester. And this is uh, already done by uh, ED EDX, okay, in conjunction with other university. For example, in September 2016, they start with 19 program. By 2019, they have already 52 program on micro masters. That means students can take one semester from their work and they can uh, compile this, stack, stack up this. Huh? It's a stackable, stackable uh, accreditation, not, not stackable uh, skill or certificate and this can be used for credit transfer 
if you want to do a full master, if you have done, let's say, at your own time, three micro masters uh, courses, probably you can use these three micro masters, then you go for a full masters for only another three or four months. So this is, the concept is the same with nano degree, but this for at the master's level. Again, it involves industry. Yeah? Micro masters again involve industry. Okay. Uh, these are the big industry, Walmart, Microsoft, that's involved with ADX for their micro masters. So these are the universities around the world that's offering micro masters at the moment, but not yet in Malaysia. GUST will start that. Old concept, but new emphasis, personalized learning is not new, but this is the way future. Huh? Because one size does not fit all, cannot use again. As, as we look at the analogy here, the learning style and the teaching style is like the lock. This must be the same so that it can fit in. So this is very personalized learning, which is made possible by online. And I think Einstein has put it very uh, rightly that uh, if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. So if you look at this, none of this will pass the examination. So we have to be very personalized uh, in terms of teaching right now uh, because with all the uh, available technology, we can do this personalized teaching very effectively. Homeschooling uh, is not a new concept, but this is again should be re-emphasized. Huh? I'd like to quote this story of uh, Watson again. Eh? This is James Watson. So one day, I don't know whether this is true or not, just pick up from... Eh? One day, the teacher gave his, this paper, he said to the student, to James Watson, give this paper to your mother. And the mother, while reading that paper, says, your son is genius. This school is too small for him and doesn't have enough good teachers for training him. Please teach him yourself. The mother told James Watson. Okay, that's fine. Later on, many, many years later, James Watson, the actual words written on that letter is actually, your son is adult, we won't let him come to school anywhere. So the moral of the story, Thomas Ava Edison was an adult child that by a hero mother became the genius of the century. The mother doesn't really tell what Edison, the actual thing. So this is homeschooling concept, more or less. But the spiritual components that the, the, the heart of the mother is very influential and very, uh, what we call, dictating yeah, to the future of his children. So say good words to your children. Always. Although he is naughty, he is stupid, but say the opposite. Oh, you are very clever. Inshallah. Yeah. Management structure. Okay, here is where uh, we are quite different. I think we are the first university in Malaysia to do this model. In this model, all our deans are from the industry. Permanently, fully. We are, they are industry players. For example, we have this school of complementary medicine. The dean is uh, Datuk Sri Steve Yap, who is the president of the Malaysian uh, Complementary and Traditional Medicine. He practiced for the past 20 years in this, and he become the dean, not an academic. The academic is only here. Myself, Professor Siti at the DVC. Two of us. Academic to guide them, to fulfill the compliances of the law, of the ministerial and departmental regulation. That's our role. The rest 
is the creator of knowledge themselves. Scope, uh, School of Humanities and Law is a lawyer practicing in Australia. Professor Kamal, Immigration, immigration Law. School of Business, Accounting and Management, Dr. Roy Prasad is a, uh, actually a human resource expert, a consultant, moving, creating knowledge. And these are our deans. And we hope this model, we don't know the success of this model, but in terms of finance, as Tansri will move on later, we are very lean financially. Because these, they are very autonomous. They develop their own school. They have their own teachers. We don't pay. But of course, they must comply with all requirements of the Act 555. That's our job. The quality-wise and so on. So financially, we are very lean under this model. Without one million, you can start a university. Okay. We are experimenting this and hopefully it will show success in terms of, of course, there's a lot of challenges. You are trying to educate the non-academic personalities to understand MQA requirements and so on. Of course, some of them, they just want to bulldoze. Say, no, no, no. The act says so, so, so. You have to comply with the act. Okay. Sooner or later, they understand the needs of compliance. Okay? But I've got a principle in my life. Don't break the law, but you can bend the law. Uh, okay? Yeah, it works. I learned from my late supervisor. I'm, my, my degree is ecology, animal ecology. We study animal in the wild. So one day, as a student in Scotland, no money. But we have to move house. Following the animal, you have to move house. Every three or four months, you have to move the new house. So moving house is not a cheap stuff. It worth a lot of money. So I said to my I have no money to move the next house. See, use the faculty Land Rover. But carry some uh, research items. If anything happen, if anything happens, you are not research field. This is bending the law. I learned from that. Huh? It's not breaking the law, it's bending the law. And for Muslim, if you look at the Quran, it allows that. I say so, why? Muslim was supposed to be prohibited from eating pork. But, if emergency arises, you can eat pork. So there is a flexi flexibility a concept there. Bending, bending. Okay? So uh, practice it in your life. Yeah? Or in a husband wife relationships, bend the law a bit. Mm. Don't tell the whole truth, partial truth. Yeah, I meet someone, yeah. Yeah, I'm meeting someone. But don't tell that someone. You tell that someone, of course, <laughs> Third World War. So stay relevant, keep educating yourself. And this is the concept of lifelong education. We are going to emphasize on this. With nano degree, with micro masters, this is lifelong learning. Nano degree, micro is lifelong learning. Uh, Alvin Toffler, you know him. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn ourselves. We mean we keep on and we have a very good motivator it, at 94 being a prime minister how you want to question yourself at 60 that you're tired of going to the office there's no way and also this guy Herbert, tomorrow's electric will not be the man who can't read he will be the man who has not learned how to learn so probably for the academician we have to look at sabbatical Sabbatical is, is a chance to look at re-equipping knowledge. They themselves can do nano degree. 
they can self can can do micro uh, courses yeah? and of course when i say more sabbatical means shorter periods because you don't need uh, one year sabbatical anymore huh? you can have three months sabbatical two months sabbatical but more frequent so the the way we give sabbatical leave to uh, academic should be changed that is in tandem with the necessity of the industry because if we graduated from phd and we never go for refreshment courses we will be left behind with the rate the exponential rate of knowledge now so we have to adapt to this no choice uh, the government the vice chancellor should think of giving uh, sabbatical leave on a two months basis three months basis or even one month basis probably have to redefine alumni because it's lifelong lifelong uh, uh, learning no alumni you can come back anytime you're not an alumni of, of um you're still a student of um so no need to re-register go on just tell your dean i'm going to enroll for one nano degree and there's no need to go all over have a student matrix your student matrix is one and for all and tansi is looking at the watch now okay so government responsibility alhamdulillah our government is very proactive they start uh, they have this blueprint in 2013 implemented for 215 and 2025 uh, the 10 shift there within that uh, uh, blueprint and later on when the new minister came in it is yusuf he did this very good framing malaysian higher education 4.0 very proactive at the ministerial level but at the education level by the officer sometimes the policy is good the implementing is not good because the officer cannot understand the message of the higher authority this is the problem there's a uh, knowledge gap between the two the policies and the implementer okay you have all this uh, approach under uh, under the kpt mqa uh, they have to be very flexible now while maintaining the quality they must look at flexibility walk the talk of the ministry they must look beyond uh what is needed for achieving this you cannot be too rigid for example now diploma is two years an mqa diploma is two years so it's not attracting student anymore because two years is too long knowledge you can absolute so probably they they can be more flexible but to have mqa diploma in one year and so on or accept nano degree three months four months or micro masters three months four months okay is our internet infrastructure or infrastructure malaysia sorry this should be a bigger thing eh? too narrow here malaysia average internet speed is 8.9 megabytes per second okay so this is not so good in terms of this if this is true uh, we need to uh, upgrade this based on this report but for my ran x is ready 100 gigabytes per second which is good for researchers and students if you look at budget 2019 210 million is allocated for to encourage migration to 4.0 for three years although not substantial but still the awareness is there to give some allocation so our government is quite proactive in this sense and for universities we should move faster than school because we are going to receive students from the school if the school move faster when the student come to our university the student will get bought the student will get problem there will be overlap of content the pedagogy might be inferior when they come to university they expected a superior 
pedagogical, technological things, but what they saw, what they experienced is much inferior to what they experienced in the school. This is where we need to realize. Okay, oh, these are all the changes. So the art of life in constant read adjustment. Your life doesn't get better by chance, it gets better by change. That is important, have an open mind, sorry, to constant change. This is very nice, these are the very basics of things to have an open mind on the changes. We need to adapt to changes. We don't need to change totally, but adapting to the changes. So with that, hope, uh, thanks very much for your time to listen, and thank you, Tansri. I pass back to you. Uh, thank you, Dato. Uh, I'm sure you all will agree with me that this has been a very excellent presentation. I mean, I learned so much today, you know, and thank you for coming and telling us all this, you know. I think my knowledge about IR4 is very outdated, really. So thank you. This is really a great thing. And I'm very sure the audience has some questions for you, Dato. So <coughs> let's uh, give Dato three questions. Thank you, Dato, for that uh, very engaging presentation. Um, my question is, yeah, you talked about the need for the open, the digital mindset, really. And I'm really encouraged by the nano degree uh, which is something we've also in talking to industry and professional bodies. I come from the accounting discipline. Um, we are exploring this micro-credentialing, but my um, problem is basically how to get this into the MQA framework, you know, getting, even we have looked at masters in digital accounting where we really want to put in the digital, uh, the, the all these IR, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, but it doesn't fit in with the existing program standard, which is about core accounting knowledge. So okay. that's a struggle I'm having. But my question basically is coming back to what we realize is that more and more in the IR, in the digital uh, economy, you need students to be, or you need people to be more human. And this is another challenge that I think we need to look at is how to be human, go back to the basic core values of being a human. And that's something that's also missing in the curriculum. What would your comment be? Okay. Thanks. Two questions, in fact. Huh? Thank you, uh, Prof. Okay, for the first question, if you want me to answer from me, you have to tackle the top people. You mean you talk to the ministers about this type of change because they are the ones who have the authority to tell MQA. Okay, that's one way. The other way is to change the MQA to me. Let me be there. <laughs> oh, you should record that. <laughs> Sorry, I always forgot. Okay, meaning we need somebody that really can be flexible to changes, constant change. Uh, but the present government, or even the, even the previous government, they are very proactive in terms of this. So I think the concept of nano degree and micro credential is not yet in their years. But one of the reasons that we are here today is to spark this off. And uh, I'll be, I might be whispering this to the ministers about this nano degree because in terms of our university, we are looking at this very seriously towards the end of this year. So it's time for me to whisper to the ministerial people about this concept and how MQA should you know, release the rigidity to allow this. As I say, the challenges is government recognition and public confidence. But I think the government recognition is more important. But it's not an uphill task because the practice has been somewhere else, not started here. Okay, number two about the human values. If you look at the Malaysian blueprint, it is number one. Although we are going on digitalization and so on, the human values, the akhlak, ethical values, should be embedded in the curriculum. This is stressed by the Malaysian blueprint, but the practice of it, okay, the practice of it, 
uh, is a very challenging thing. But I think that as a university, we must look at giving the student this exposure. That's why when the new ministers came in to lead the uh, education ministry, they are looking at his ideas of giving this humanistic values, ethical values to the formative years of the children, meaning the primary school. Because if you compare at uh, primary education in Finland or Japan, they don't look at knowledge per se in these formative years. They really go for the, these uh, human values to be embedded in their DNA. I think this to be done at the formative years. But once they arrive at the university, there's a Malay proverb, Rebung uh, sudah jadi buluh, something like that. Uh, the, the bamboo shoot has become bamboo. Uh, cannot ban anymore once they come to the university. So this has to be a very holistic, comprehensive approach by the government at the formative years. Um, I'm Farida. I'm a former ex school member of Transparency International. I'm very interested in uh, the points you made. Number one, lifelong learning. And number two, akhlak. So my question is, would you accept a senior student like myself? Because I believe in lifelong learning. Right now, I'm actually pursuing a long distance uh, uh, post-grad course as well. So uh, a senior, will you accept a senior student who can also give back to your students? Um, being a very active member of Transparency International, what I promote is uh, not quite the anti-corruption bit, but the integrity uh, um, aspect uh, of Transparency International. So if I can, if I can uh, have your time at some point uh, to see how I can give back in that, because to me, uh, technology cannot replace akhlaq in any way. And I think we are seeing right now, slowly creeping, where uh, technology uh, has sacrificed uh, akhlaq, maybe not from totally Islamic point of view, but even um, social etiquette and things like that, um, I think it's already creeping in. So it's, it's something that that is uh, very close to my heart, basically. Um, so I, I wonder if we can uh, get into that with um, Genovasi uh, Uni yeah. at some point. Thanks. Thank you, Farida. The answer is very short, yes. We can accept uh, no age limit. Even Prime Minister can come in at the age of 94 and have a micro credentials once we establish this. Because our micro credential is for reskilling, relearning, and so on. So there's no issue of age as long as the willingness is there. On your second note of uh, this akhlaq, uh, this ethics, well, uh, this is a deeper part of the whole structure. If you look at the onions, the, 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 the technology is the surface, the inner is the uh, ethics and so on, the moral and the ethics. So as I said, the solution is not straightforward. It has to be in the formative years of the studentships, early in the primary school. And when I say that, I mean the government's uh, policy is already there. The policy is already there, but the implementation wise. Because when we want to implement this with numbers, there is the constraint. Uh, if you want to teach two students against 200 students in a classroom, this is a problem of numbers. So, whatever it is, uh, we should look at this holistically and collaboratively. Meaning to say, the, all segments of the population has to work towards this, of enriching the teachings of this ethics. Yeah. They mean there will be no, let's say the curriculum is only in the primary school. There's no curriculum or syllabus on ethics in the secondary school or in the university. So that's why at one moment, uh, at that time, Tokpa was the Minister of Education. I told him, Tokpa, we need a committee comprising of uh, uh, nursery, expert, teachers, primary school, secondary school, 
and universities and involve politics. So there is a continuum. If you have a committee detached from each other, then we are not looking at the same picture. You understand what I mean? So we need to have a very holistic, collaborative along the spectrum. So if this, uh, there is committee on this, the government and, uh, establish this committee comprising all these segments of educators, inshallah, we look at the same picture at the same time by the same group of people. That's one way of looking things. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Now, actually, we can confidently say this is really the future. You know, I mean, we cannot avoid this because we are in the uh, era where we cannot run away from AI, computers, and so on. So, so I think this university, Genova University, is the future, and uh, we wish Dato well in his job, and hopefully, this will be a, a Malaysian success in the future, and we can get. Uh, we can edu educate everybody from young to to as old as Tun Mahade, you know, uh, in a cheap way, but uh, really up to date in their knowledge and so on. Give that a round of applause.